Bibles and turn to the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter number 5. I want you to find 2 Kings chapter number 5 in the Old Testament, and also for a cross-reference a little later on in the message, Mark chapter 1. So if you'll find 2 Kings chapter number 5 and Mark chapter 1, you can put a piece of paper there in Mark chapter 1, or if you want to hold it with your finger, you're welcome to do so. It will be a little later in the message, uh, but we'll look at that as a cross-reference. And 2 Kings chapter number 5, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, Joshua, Judges, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, long about there for you new Christians. 2 Kings chapter number 5, now if you find that, I still hear the pages turning. Boy, that's a, for a pastor, that's a beautiful sound, the pages of the Bible. Uh, turning. 2 Kings chapter number 5 and Mark chapter number 1. Now, during my senior year of high school, back up in Lincoln Park, Michigan, when I lived up in the far and desolate wilderness up there before I came to the promised land. <laughs> And I have lived down here longer than I have lived up there. And my mom and dad were born and raised in Alabama. So I've got good blood. <laughs> but during my senior year of high school, I competed in and won first place at the annual junior senior talent show at the school. Performing two numbers, I accompanied myself on the piano, and I, I sang a Christian song to start with. And then the next number, I wanted everybody to know that you could have fun and be a Christian too. So I beat the piano, a la Jerry Lee Lewis, <laughs> and I played with my feet uh, in that same number. And apparently the judges enjoyed the performance, and so I was crowned the winner. <laughs> On the last day of school in my senior year, we had received our yearbooks, and each of us was running around, and with all of our friends trying to get them to write a, uh, a, you know, one of those good luck, best wishes, hope your life goes well kind of notes in all of our yearbooks. And so I was walking down the, the hallway of LPHS with the joy and exuberance that comes when you graduated from high school. And the president of the student body, Craig Creesman, a friend of mine, well, more acquaintance, but I knew him, uh, gone to school many years together. He was the president of the student body. He came up to me with a typed list in his hand, and he says, Hey, hey, Vince, did, did you see this? And I looked at the place on the page where his finger was pointing, and, and the words read, Voting most talented, Vincent Estill. Well, and, until then, I, I was unaware of being voted most talented. I, you know, I'm thinking real quick, since I won the talent show, that that's probably why I, I was voted in it. And so my face brightened up, you know, my, my shoulders kicked back a little bit, and a big smile comes across my face. It, it was just a great pleasure, and, and I was full of pride, and until Craig followed up with this comment. Yeah, I was actually voted most talented, but since I already was voted most likely to succeed, the yearbook staff suggested your name. You did get the next most votes. <laughs> to say that the air was let out of my balloon is an understatement. I mean, why, why did Craig have to say that? What would it have hurt? What would it have hurt? For me to believe the rest of my life that I was voted the most talented in my high school senior class. What would it have hurt? 
Syria. 
Assyria was a great man with his king, the master, and with his master, the king, and he was honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor. Everybody say that next word together. But. Spreads. 
Sin always defiles and isolates. And just as leprous garments are fit only for the fire, so those who die clothed in sin will burn forever. What a spiritual picture of the thing that defiles our lives every single day. When we were created, we were created with perfection, with no blemish, and with nothing to detract from a perfect and good, long life. That's how we were created. But then a fatal thing called sin entered in. And sin robs us of our life. Sin robs our life of its wholeness and completeness and perfection. Life has been spoiled. Life has been ruined by sin. Do you believe that? Can you understand? Can you give me a witness? Amen. Every one of our lives, different stories for each one of us. But it can be described as, well, we do this, and then we have that, and, and then there's the other. But, and there's always the but. But, there's a fly in the ointment. But something is wrong somewhere in every single one of our lives. Something is wrong somewhere. And it sucks all the joy out of what? You see, each of us is infected with a soul disease that messes up our lives. And there is only one person with the cure. Say amen. 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 Sin is the something that always spoils a good life. And at our very best, on our best day, we cannot cure ourselves of the ills of sin. Let's right. look at verse 2. Look at verse 2 of 2 Kings chapter 5. And the Syrians, they had gone out by uh, companies, we would probably say battalions. Uh, they went out militarily, attacked Israel, and actually had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a, a young little girl, a, a, a little maid, and Naaman took her as a slave into his own house. So gave the little Jewish girl she waited on Naaman's wife in their home. Probably did the cooking, cleaning, and helping uh, around with household chores. And this little girl from Israel, in verse 3, she said to her mistress, Well, would God, my Lord, speaking of Naaman, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, back from where I'm from. For he would recover him of his leprosy. Well, one went in and told his Lord Naaman, saying, Thus and thus said the little maid that is of the land of Israel. And so the king of Syria, his good friend, he probably Naaman, said, King, I, I've heard there's a guy over here that can, you know, cure me of my leprosy. And so the king says, Go, go to, go ahead. Man, I'm for you. I will send the letter to the king of Israel for you. And so he departed and took with him, Naaman took 10 talents of silver, 6,000 pieces of gold, 10 changes of raiment, and he brought the letter from the king of Syria <laughs> to the king of Israel, saying, Now, when this letter is come unto you, this is the writing of the king of Syria to the king of Israel, when you read this letter, O king of Israel, and when it comes to you, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to you, so that you may recover him of his leprosy. Heal him, Mr. Israeli king. Watch his response. It came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes. Now that's old English. He didn't 
didn't actually rent the tuxedo or anything like that. He, he tore, he ripped his clothes, he was so upset. And he says, who does this guy think I am? Does he think I'm God? Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man does sin to me to recover a man of his leprosy? Is he nuts? Let me tell you what I think he's up to. Let, listen, listen to me, I pray. Thank you. Consider this. See what he's doing. This is what he's really up to. He seeks a quarrel against me because when I can't heal his leprous friend, he's going to make war against me. You know, in Naaman's life, everything is soured because of one thing. He was left. Now, obviously, Naaman had gone to all the doctors, spent a lot of money on those physicians. They did their best, but Naaman goes on suffering and the disease gets worse and worse. And we're told here in the Bible that explicitly, we are told that the, the most powerful men in the world at that time, the movers and the shakers in the highest government offices, they're baffled. They're dumbfounded. I mean, the king of Israel could not cure Naaman any more than the king of Syria. Now, back in those days, if you read the Old Testament, you find that each king kept a, a large cadre of the brightest and the smartest and the wisest and the strongest people in his whole kingdom. He had magicians and astrologers and physicians and wise men and soothsayers and all-around smart people.
why I can't get out from under this. I just don't understand. I mean, bewildered. We can't figure it out. When, why we have it so good? When we have it so good, why we're still so unhappy? What is that flying? There's always a but. There's always a drawback. There's always a stone in the path. And we feel like we're being pushed around by unseen evil forces and uncontrollable circumstances from which we cannot escape. You know what the saddest part for most of us is? The cure is here. We just don't see it. You see, each of us is infected with a soul disease that messes up our lives. And there's only one person with the cure. Say amen. amen. Sin is something that always spoils a good life. And at our very best, we cannot cure ourselves of the ills of sin. The world is ignorant of the solution, but there is, and always has been, a cure. Why don't you look at verse 8? Look at verse 8. And it was so, when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had ripped his clothes, that he said to the king, saying, why did you rip the clothes up? Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Why are you tearing your good shirts? Man, Let it come now to me, and he, Naaman, shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot, all of his silver and his gold and changes of raiment and, and the silk and linen. I mean, some pretty stuff. And he stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha, rather than going out himself, sent a little peon messenger out to him saying, uh, Mr. Naaman, you go wash in the Jordan River seven times, and your flesh shall come again to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry, was full of wrath. He went away and he said, What? I thought that this prophet dude would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hands around and strike his hand over the place of the leprosy and say some kind of prayer or magic potion or incantation and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? We've got to be kidding. That muddy Jordan River, may I not wash in the rivers of Damascus, should be clean. So he turns away and goes away in a rage. Servants finally catch up with him and they come near and they speak to him and said, My father, Mr. Naaman, if the prophet had bid you do some great thing, would you not have done it? And how much rather then, when he says to you, wash in the Jordan River and be clean? I mean, what can it hurt, Mr. Naaman? And then went he down and dipped himself seven times in the muddy Jordan River, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again, like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Here's this great man, Naaman, suffering from leprosy. Everything tried, everything failed. He was beginning to feel utterly hopeless, but God provides Remedy for our leprosy. Say amen. amen. Now we can spend our days, we can spend all of our lives looking for a remedy in all of the wrong places. Or we can turn our attention to God and to Jesus Christ. The little servant girl, 
She could not cure leprosy, but she knew who could. Amen. She pointed Naaman not to a place, but to a person. Whatever our problem, whatever the running sore of our soul, thing that gives us that heartache, whatever the thing that's getting us down and damning and ruining our life, there is a cure. Say amen. amen. It's not a place. It's a person. And he knows all about us. And he can heal us. He can heal our soul. He can heal our spirit. And he can rid us of this thing that spoils life for us. Say amen. amen. Look, at, look at Mark chapter 1. Look at Mark chapter 1 and verse number 40. Look at that reference I told you. Mark chapter 1 and verse number 40. And there came a leper to him, begging him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him. And said to him, I will be you clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him. And he was cleansed. When, when the untouchable is touched by Jesus, immediately.
thank you that you sent your darling son, Jesus Christ, because you love us. You know all there is to know about us, and you still love us. You want to touch us. You want to heal us. You want to heal our soul and heal our spirit and get rid of this thing that spoils life for us. Each one of us is infected with this soul disease that messes up our lives. There's only one person with the cure. The Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you for that. Speak to hearts now, Lord. Speak to hearts. We pray. You wouldn't be in this church building now if deep down you didn't believe there must be an answer. There must be a solution. There must be a cure. And there is. It's not a place. It's a person. And if you've not experienced a relationship with Jesus Christ through faith in Him, then you've not been touched by God in your soul. And that's why life is so dissatisfying. The Bible diagnoses your problem as spiritual leprosy. It's inside you. And it's spreading. And it defiles and isolates you. No wonder you feel lonely and empty and isolated. Not only are you spiritually sick, but you're also unclean in the sight of God. But there's good news. Good news. Jesus has compassion on you. He knows all about you, and he loves you the same. He wants to touch you. He wants to cleanse you. He wants to make you whole. And all that he asks is that you come to him in faith. Now, if you understand the gospel, you can do that in your pew if you'd like. Because it's not a place, it's a person. But we believe that by coming forward and kneeling at the altar of prayer, you'll help solidify the spiritual decision that you're making. On the other hand, if you're not sure about the gospel message, someone from our church will meet you at the altar and show you the way of salvation. Either way, I, either way, I invite you to come. Stop letting the leprosy of sin spoil your good life. You can go away from here today singing, He touched me. With a step forward in faith, let Jesus touch you. Would you come? Maybe you have family members or friends in their lives you can see the the devastating effects of spiritual leprosy. They need the touch of Jesus. Feel free to come to the Lord's altar and pray God's mercy and compassion on them. As we sing the train, 505, let's sing that he touched me again. Some are coming, we need prayer partners. Others, please, as we sing this, you're welcome to come and pray. Struggle by the